morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning, April 16th service. Now, this morning, I want to do something a little different. So we're going to open up the service with words of prayer, and then we're going to sing one song, and then I'm going to go right into the preaching of the words, and then we're going to sing at the end of the service because of the, the kind of sermon that I'm going to preach, and I think it's better if we do it this way. So let's open up in the words of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given unto us, Lord. God, I thank you for another opportunity that you've given to me and to my brothers and sisters in Christ to come and to join together in this building, Lord, for the purpose to lift up our voice, to glorify your wonderful name, to lift up the name which is higher than any other name, the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And Father, I ask you for your blessing. I ask you for your anointing. I ask you that you move inside your side of this room, Lord. And God, I know that you prepared this day long time ago, and there's a reason. There's a purpose for this day, Lord. So I know that your will always come to pass, and I know that your purpose always going to be fulfilled because no one can stop you. No one can withhold you, Lord. And God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing a song. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. They are found you waiting. They are found you waiting. And they are found. Yes, Lord, that's what we find release, Lord. In your presence, Lord. At your feet, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
right now, Lord. Right now we worship you, Lord. For you alone. You alone is so good. You alone are so merciful, Lord. You alone are so gracious, Lord. You alone are so powerful, Lord. You alone knows and understand everything about us, Lord. You alone can change the situation and circumstance, Lord. Only you can perform miracle, Lord. For you are a miracle working Savior. You are a miracle working God. Thank you, Lord. I want to speak about the power of faith. The power of faith. And I'm going to, may the Lord bless the preaching of his word, I'm going to preach from Mark chapter 5, beginning from verse 21 to verse 23. In Mark chapter 5, from beginning of verse 21 to 23, we, we, we read about Jesus' two miracles. In this verse, Jesus performed two mighty miracles. And the format that we found these miracles are in a sandwich format. It began with Jairus uh, looking for Jesus because he had a problem with his young daughter. And then why Jairus was talking to Jesus a woman came into the scene. She was sick for 12 years. She was bleeding for 12 years. And she came to Jesus looking for a miracle. Now, are we going to see Jesus did perform a miracle? And then the story go back, goes back to Jairus, and we see the second miracle that Jesus is going to perform when he raised uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now, as we look at this story this morning, the first thing that we can learn, the first thing that comes to our mind is this. Jesus cares for those who are in trouble. Anytime we look at the scripture, when we find people who are in trouble, we find Jesus. Because Jesus is attracted to people who are in trouble. And the reason that Jesus is attracted to people that are in trouble because Jesus is the all-powerful God, is the omnipotent God, is the God who has the, the power to perform any miracle. Nature, demon, sickness, even death must surrender to the power of Jesus. And as we are going to look to this two story this morning, we see the sovereign authority that Jesus has. And that Jesus always display when he come to minister to the need of your people. 
Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Now when Jesus across over again by boat to the other side a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea Jesus is on the move this is the period in Jesus ministry when his popularity is at the top see Jesus performing miracle is feeding the, uh, the, the those who are hungry and people attracted to him because of the sign and the wonder that Jesus is performing so everywhere Jesus went people follow him everywhere Jesus went the multitude gathered together because they want to listen to him but also they want to witness more miracle that Jesus was going to do and he said there, he crossed over, he went back to the other side of the lake, and when he got on the other side of the lake, a great multitude gathered around him. And Jesus was standing by the seashore, and he was ministering to the need of, his, of the people. Verse 22, and behold, now, I want you to imagine in your mind the scene. There's a, great, there's a large multitude that is surrounding Jesus by the seashore, and Jesus is teaching them. And here come the ruler of the synagogue. His name was Jairus. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Listen to me. When you have a need, when you have a problem, you can come to Jesus. Jesus will never turn you, you away. Jesus, he will never tell you, not today, come back tomorrow, come back next week, come back next month, come back next year. No, when you have a need, you can come right then to Jesus. And he will listen to you. Look at the picture. Jesus is surrounded by the great multitude. And here come Jairus. He's, a, he's the ruler of the synagogue. He was in charge of the services. The building where, you know, the law was read. Where the law was taught. He was a man of distinction. He was a man... Who was, who was known in his community as a religious and as a prestigious man. But I want you to know that this man has a problem. This man has a need. So he's looking for Jesus. And when he, when he found Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he fell at the feet of Jesus. He forgot about his pride. He forgot about what people was going to think about him. But when he saw Jesus, he fell at the feet of Jesus. Listen to me. Sometimes we, we are so proud to admit that we have a problem, that we have a need. Sometimes we are so proud to go to Jesus and to admit our failure, our shortcoming, the thing we're struggling with. But let me tell you something. This man had a need. This man had a problem. And this man understood the, the only solution to his problem was Jesus. So he came to Jesus. He saw him and he fell at his feet. He humbled and fell of the feet of Jesus. His action shows great humility. And that's what a lot of time God wants to see from us, humility. He wants us to humble ourselves before him, to understand that we are nothing. We can do nothing, and we depend upon him all the time. That's the kind of attitude that God wants to see from those who seek him, a humble Humility. Verse 23. He saw Jesus. He fell on his 
knees. And he begged him earnestly. Notice, he begged Jesus. Not, not wishy-washy, earnestly. He put out his heart to Jesus. He put out his tears in front of Jesus. He begged Jesus. That's what desperation does. Desperation makes you beg. And looking for help. And he said, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Jairus had one daughter. She's 12 years old. And she at the point of death. The doctor told Jared that there was nothing else that could do for his daughter. The doctor said there is no hope. We try everything. We try the best medication, everything that we know to do. But I'm sorry. We can't do. But somewhere, some, somewhere, 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 Jairus heard about Jesus. Jairus heard that there was a teacher going around who had power. And who had the ability to heal sick people. So because of the news that he heard about Jesus, see, faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, the way our faith becomes stored up is when we hear about Jesus, when we hear about who he is, what he can do for us, and when we learn how much Jesus loves us and how he cares about our need, we can go to him with confidence, knowing that he's going to do something about. See, this man came to Jesus in faith. He believed that Jesus could help him. And he said, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she might be healed. And she will live. Notice about this man's faith. He already had all program in his mind. Before he came to Jesus, he imagined what was going to happen. He was going to find Jesus. He was going to fall on his knees. He was going to beg Jesus. Jesus was going to say yes. And Jesus was going to go to his house. Jesus was going to lay his hand upon his daughter. He was going to say something. And immediately, his daughter was going to be healed. And she was not going to die. Now, I want you to notice something. When this man came to Jesus, he did not beat around the bushes. Lord, you know my need. I don't have to tell you, Lord. You know what I'm going through. No. A lot of times, God wants to hear from our lips what is our situation, what is our problem. This man went to Jesus and straight forward, he told Jesus about his problem. And he said, it's urgent, Jesus. It's a matter of urgency. 911, stop. Drop everything that you're doing because you're the only hope that I have. I have no other hope. It's you of death. It's you or a funeral. It's you or a burial. These are the two solutions that are left. That are left. Verse 24. So Jesus, don't you love this? Jesus went with them. He didn't say, oh, Jairus, I'm busy. Look, look at this crowd. You know, I, you know, I, I, I got to teach them. I got to preach them. I, I got to tell them about salvation. I got to tell them about repentance. I got to tell them about the gift of God. So Jesus said, no, you are a desperate man. That's why you're here. That's why you're on your knees. That's why you're begging me. Because you have, a, 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 you have a, an impossible situation. So Jesus went 
with them. Went with them. And the multitude, the word there, follow Jesus. I want you to know that they thronged him. They press against him. They touch him. They squeeze him. They were, they were surrounding him. Actually, in the original Greek, it, it, the, the word used for pressing, for thronging, it means that they came together as a crowd on every side. And they were pressing. They were crowding around him and there was no room for any movement they, jesus was so so surrounded by this crowd that he could barely walk one step at a time so jesus went with them when you call upon jesus he's going to answer right away verse 25 Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. So Jesus in the, is on the move. He's following Jairus to his, to his house. But suddenly, a certain woman appeared. Now, this woman had a problem too. This woman had a Flow of, for 12 years, on and off, she'd been bleeding from her private parts. She, she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had a discharge of blood. That according to the law, when someone had a discharge of blood, he was, he was going to be considered an unclean person. She was supposed to, to isolate herself from the rest of her family. If anyone will come in contact with her, if anyone will touch her, he will become unclean. And he has to separate it, go in isolation for seven days. If she sat on, the, on a chair and then someone else sat, sat on the same chair, the person that sat on the chair was going to be considered unclean. And for seven days, he was going to be isolated. So imagine the kind of life that this woman was, was, had been living for the past 12 years. She was isolated from her family. She could not go out in the street because if they find out that she had this issue of blood, she could get into trouble. So here she comes. For 12 years, she's been sick. Verse 26. Now, let's look at the picture. She has suffered many things from many physicians. For 12 years, she's been going from one doctor to another doctor. They did all kind of tests. They run all kind of whatever they do. They put you through the machine, and, and, and they do this, and they do that. For 12 years, she suffered many things from many physicians. And she has spent all that she had. All her savings were gone. All the money that she had, she had in the bank were gone because of all the medical bill that she accumulated over 12 years. And to make things worse, she didn't get any better. Actually, she got worse. As you can see, it's not a pretty picture. We have a sick woman who, who's running from all this doctor, spending all her money, and instead to get better, she got worse. Again, impossible situation. Impossible situation. Verse 27, when she, note it, again, when she heard about Jesus, someone, someone, somehow, somewhere, Jairus heard about Jesus. That's why he came to Jesus. Somehow, somewhere, this woman heard about Jesus. She heard 
of a miracle worker whose name was Jesus. She heard about someone in town who had the power and the ability and the willingness. So you could have the power, you could have the ability, but maybe you don't have the willingness to minister to someone in need. But she heard about Jesus. I want you to know this. Remember, there was a crowd thronging Jesus. The crowd was surrounding Jesus. They, they, he could barely move. But she came behind him in the crowd. I want you to think for a minute. We have a woman who is bleeding for 12 years. She must have been weak. When you lose blood for 12 years, you become anemic. You become weak. You can't stand up, but somehow, somewhere, when she came close and she saw where Jesus was, she made way through the crowd. She kept pushing people on the side. She came behind him in the crowd, and she touched Jesus' clothing. She touched his garment. Twelve years sick, she heard about Jesus. She came, she found him, she saw him, she made her way to the crowd, and she touched the hem of his garment. Now look what happened, verse 28. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes. Remember what Jairus said, Jairus had already made in his mind well, what was going to happen? I found Jesus. I fall on my knees. I beg him. I tell him about my situation. Jesus said, yes, I'm going to come with you. Jesus is going to come to my house. He's going to lay hands on my daughter. He's going to say what he has to say. And then my daughter is going to live. Now, look at this woman. She said, this woman is laying home. Is in is home. Perhaps she's laying in bed. And she heard that there was Jesus in town. He, he, he was someplace close by. So as she laying him down, as she's sitting in the house, she said, if only I can touch his clothes. You talk about fate. She said, all I need to do is get close to Jesus. Because if I can touch his I don't need him to put his hand on me. I don't need him to say words. I don't need him to rebuke and to command this bleeding to stop. If I can only touch his clothes, I shall, notice, I shall be made well. No doubt. She said, if I can touch his clothes, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be healed. 29, immediately, no, I want you to know that immediately, if I can only touch it close, I'm going to be ill. And I want you to know that she came to the crowd. She made his way to the crowd. She touched Jesus' clothes and immediately, the moment she touched Jesus' clothes, the fountain of her blood was dried up. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Immediately. I want you to know, and she felt in her body that she'd been healed of her affliction. She knew. She knew that something happened within her body. She knew that she was healed. No doubt, she knew, she knew. Listen to me, when Jesus touched you, you're going to know that Jesus touched you. When you come to Jesus with your need, when you come to Jesus with your promise, and Jesus touched you, you will know that something happened in your life, in your situation, in your circumstance. You will now, he's not going to leave you wondering, am I healed? If this thing is going to turn around, this thing is going to change. No, you will know. 
the Itachi. She knew immediately that she was healed of her affliction. I want you to know that it said that the crowd was following Jesus. The crowd was surrounding Jesus. The crowd was touching Jesus. But know that only one woman was healed. Know that everybody was touching Jesus. But only one woman was healed. See, there is a difference about thronging Jesus and touching him. You could go through the motion. You could call yourself a religious person. You could go to church all that you want. But unless you get close enough to Jesus to touch him, nothing is going to happen to you. The crowd was strong in Jesus. The crowd was touching Jesus. But only one woman had faith enough to touch Jesus and to be healed. She came. She touched him. It worked. It worked. And the reason that it worked, because this woman came to Jesus with faith. She came to Jesus believing that the moment she was going to touch Jesus, she was going to be healed. It was a personal faith in Jesus that distinguished her from all the other people that were in the crowd. See, they were strong at Jesus. They, they want to see things that Jesus was going to do. But this woman had a problem. And she touched Jesus. And she was healed. That's why a lot of times people come to Jesus. People come to church. They walk through those door with, with problems. They walk through the door in need. And they go home with the same problem, with the same need that they came in. Why? Because they failed to touch Jesus. They were thronging, but they, were not, they did not touch him. They did not get close enough to touch Jesus. And they did not expect, they did not believe that the moment they were going to touch Jesus, something was going to happen to them. But this woman was different. She said, I'm going to touch Jesus. And I know that when I'm going to touch Jesus, I'm going to be healed. And immediately, immediately, she was healed. And she knew it. And she knew it. Verse 30. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? I want you to notice something. Not only the woman knew that immediately she was healed, but Jesus also knew that power went out from him. To know that immediately Jesus knew that someone had touched him in faith. And when whoever touched him in faith, power came out from him. And power went into the person who touched him. And the power that came out from Jesus and entered into the body of the person who touched him performed a mighty miracle. And a miracle took place. See, Jesus immediately knew the power had gone out of him. Jesus turned around. He's looking at the crowd, and he said, he asked a question, who touched my clothes? Who touched my robe? Verse 31. But his disciples said to him, Jesus, look, look at the multitude. They're thronging you. They're surrounding you. They're pressing against you. They're touching you. They're squeezing you. And you saying, oh, touch me? There's so many people that are touching you. How can you know who's oh, touching you when so many people are touching you? And why are you asking this foolish question? Who oh, touched me? Everybody's touching you. Verse 32. And he looked around. To see her who had done this thing. Jesus looking around. He wants to know. He wants to see who touched him. Verse 33. But the woman 
fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Have you ever heard about Dine and Dash? Did you ever heard about the term Dine and Dash? Dine and Dash is like a term about people who go to a restaurant and they sit down and they order food and they eat and then they're trying to sneak out of the restaurant without paying the bill. That's what's called Dine and Dash. So this woman, what this woman was, was trying to do, she was trying and heal a dash. She, were try, she came to Jesus, she touched him, she was healed, and then she wanted to walk away without nobody knowing what happened to her. She's trying a trick not to let everybody know, but it didn't work. Who touched me? Now the woman realized he knows it's me. He knows that I'm the one who touched him. He know that I'm the one who, who have been healed. He know that the power that came out from him, he went inside my body and healed my sickness. So she was afraid. She trembled. But knowing what happened to her, she came, again, notice, she fell down before him. Humility. I mean, she got a miracle ready, but she fell before him, and he told the whole truth. He told everybody. He told the whole crowd that was there. Whatever happened to her. Now, why did Jesus just let her go? Huh? Why did Jesus say, okay, somebody healed, touched me, they got healed, good. They got what they wanted. But no, Jesus wants her to tell her story. There's a couple reasons why. Number one is for the earth's sake. Jesus wants the woman to come and to tell her story for her sake. Because... She, Jesus wanted the woman to know, I am more than a healer. I want to be your friend. I want to be your savior. I want to be the one that you trust upon every day of your life. I don't want you to just trust in me in this situation and then go away and forget about me. No, I want you to tell everybody else for your own sake. And for you to understand and realize what I did for you. I want everybody to listen to me. Listen to me. When you pray and God does something for you, God expects you to tell, to show gratitude. And, I, and when we get down to verse 34, Jesus called this woman daughter. It's the only woman in the Bible that Jesus addressed her as a daughter. He did not use this term for anybody else. See, if Jesus did not ask her to come forward and to tell her story, she was not going to receive this compliment from the lips of Jesus that he called her a daughter. There's another reason that Jesus wanted this woman to tell everybody what happened to her for their sake. Because perhaps there was other sick people in the crowd. Perhaps there was other people in the crowd who were going through a hard time. So Jesus said, tell them your story. Tell them what I can do for them so they can also trust and believe in me so that their faith can be stored up. And instead to throng me, they can touch me in faith. It can receive the miracle. This is another reason why Jesus touched this woman. It's because he wanted to bless her in a special way. And also, 
Jesus told the women to tell a story. Remember, Jairus is there. Jairus' daughter is dying. Jairus' daughter is at the point of death. So Jesus wanted the woman to tell a story how she was healed. So that Jairus' faith, it can be strengthened. So can Jairus can also believe that whatever happened to her, it will happen to him and to his daughter. See the reason why Jesus did not allow this woman to disappear as an unknown person who received a miracle because he wanted to help her and he wanted other people to be helped by the miracle that just took place. You know, when they invent, when they invented chloroform, Sir James Simpson was dying. A friend said to him, you will soon be resting on the bosom of Jesus. Simpson looked at his friend and humbly replied, I don't know about that, but only I want to do is just touch the hem of his garment. That's all I want to do. Sitting on his bosom, that's okay. But if I can touch the hem of his garment, that's good enough. That's good enough. Now let's go back to Jairus. So let's take the picture. Jairus came to Jesus. He fell on his feet, on his, on his knees. He begged Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I have one daughter. She's 12 years old. She's dying. I need your help. Jesus said, let's go. Now, a little interruption happened. Can you imagine, Jairus, what was, what was going through his mind? Come on, woman. You've been sick for 12 years. Could you wait another day to come to Jesus? It, it's a, it's, it's an, it, 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 this is a, an emergency. My daughter's dying. You're wasting time. So all this talk probably going through Jairus' mind. He's probably getting nervous. He's probably getting a little angry. Because in his mind, Jesus is wasting time. His situation is very important. He requires an immediate attendance. An immediate attendance. Who touched me? Who care who touched you? Let's go! Let's go to my house. Verse 34, and he said to her daughter, your faith, note it, your faith. See, the crowd didn't have, any, all the people in the crowd didn't have any faith. Only this woman had faith. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. The key is faith. God only operates when we demonstrate faith. Trust in him. It was the woman's faith that was the key to the miracle. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue house and said, your daughter is dead. Wow. Now we have a bad situation becoming worse. We have a bad situation becoming an impossible situation. Jesus was still talking. Some of the ruler, some of the servants, some people from the house came looking for him. And they said, Jairus, we got bad news. Your daughter's dead. Now, I want you to notice. Why trouble the teacher any further? What? Stop bothering Jesus. She's dead. He can do nothing for her. Nobody can touch dead people. Nobody can bring dead people to life. All hope is gone. All hope is lost. Why do you trouble Jesus? You feel sometimes like that? 
Huh? Do you feel like that? You have a problem? And you want to bother Jesus? And sometimes you think you could, you could solve the situation on your own? You, f you could fix your own problem and you try, 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 try? And he said to make things better, you make things worse? Huh? Why you bother Jesus? Leave him alone. Let him enjoy the crowd. Verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. What was the word? What was the word that was spoken? Your daughter is dead. Why do you bother the master, the teacher, anymore? Now, I want you to notice what Jesus does. He heard. He heard the bad news. He, had the, he heard the bird report. He said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. The way Jesus responds to, to the bad news is by challenging Jairus. He said, Jairus, I heard the bad news. You heard the bad news. What I want you to do is I want you to stop being afraid and I want you to only believe. In the original Greek, is a, it's a preempt, which means stop fearing, only believe. Stop it right now. Right now. Right now. Just trust in me. Trust in me. Don't try to believe and be, you know, and be afraid at the same time. Just trust and believe. Don't try to figure it out. Don't, don't stop blaming. I know, I know probably now you want to blame the woman. It's her fault. She wasted my, gee, my time. If, if this woman did not come on the scene, everything was going to be all right. But Jairus, and that's what Jesus is telling us this morning. Are you have a, do you have a problem this morning? Are you... I, are you watch me the live stream. Are you have a need? You have a situation that you're going through. Perhaps it's impossible, and the doctor maybe told you the same thing. There's no hope for you. There's nothing that I can, can be done for you, huh? Jesus is challenging you and I this morning, and the challenging the challenge that is is giving to us is don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Despise all the appearance. I'm not distracted, Jesus said. Despise all the appearance. I'm not disinterested. I know your problem. I know your need. Not a change in my situation, Jesus said. Not a change for me. She was sick, now she's dead. What's the big deal? It does not change the outcome. Just believe. Stop being afraid. See, fear is the opposite of faith. When you have faith, you trust in Jesus. When you don't trust in Jesus, you're afraid. Never going to be healed. My daughter never going to be saved. My son never going to be saved. Things are going to get worse. Nothing good is going to come out. Faith and fear, they, can go, they don't go together. They repel each other. That's why Jesus said, do not. Oh, but, 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 but look, at, look, I don't see any evidence that nothing is happening. Jairus didn't see any evidence that his daughter was going to be healed or brought her back from the dead. But still, Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. And that's what God is challenging you and I. Believe me. Believe, believe, believe. 37. And he, uh, it's, no, it's interesting now. I want you to know. That, remember, Jesus is going to Jairus' house. The multitude is following Jesus. They're thronging him. They're surrounding him. They're pressing against him. Now, the bad news, the bad news came. So Jesus did not permit 
anyone to follow him. So Jesus said, okay, from now on, you guys, crowd, go home. And I want you to know, even from his 12 disciples, he only took three. He took Peter, James, and John. He said, Peter, James, and John, you come with me. The rest, stay here or go home. Verse 38. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. As soon as he got to John's house, there was a professional weeper. You know what happened during Bible time? When somebody died, you hire people, and you pay them money to cry and to wail and to scream and to pull a hair and, and to make all kind of commotion because there was a dead person in the house. And that's what happened up here. Why Jairus was bringing Jesus and a daughter died, somebody had, came up with the idea, let's hire some wailers and let them weep, let them cry. And when Jesus got there, he saw all this commotion, he saw all this weeping, he saw all this noise, 39. When he came in, he said to them, why, why, why making this commotion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They knew she was dead. That's why they're crying. Jesus heard the news, your daughter's dead. Why do you bother the master? But when Jesus went in the house, Jesus said, hey, what's a big commotion? Relax. Wipe your, wipe your face. Wash your face. The child is not dead, sleeping. She's just taking a rest. She's taking a nap. Verse 40. And they ridicule him. They laugh at Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Are you a clown? Stop being ridiculous. We checked the pulse. No pulse. No heartbeat. We try CPR and we try. It's too late. The brain is dead. All the organs are deteriorating already. Don't be so silly. Silly. They ridicule Jesus. Sometimes we do the same thing. When we don't believe, we ridicule him. We tell him he can't do it. I want you to notice. Jesus cannot operate in an environment of unbelief. He put them all outside. Get out. Get out of the house. He threw everybody out of the house. Go cry someplace else. But when he had put all outside, he took the father and he took the mother of the child who were where and those who were with them. So he took mama, he took papa, he took Peter, James, and John, and he went inside where the child was laying dead. He threw everybody out. Only God, the only thing that moved God is faith and an atmosphere of faith. Nothing else will. 41. Then he took the child by the hand. He got close to the, he got close to the dead child. He took the, he took the hand of the child. And he said to her, Talita Kumi, 
which means in, in English, little girl, I say to you, wake up. Wake up. Look, Mama Dada, Peter, James, and John, look the hands, little girl. Get up. For each other. Immediately. Remember? The women with the issue of blood, blood should touch Jesus, and immediately. N not next day, not next week, not next month. She has faith to be immediately healed. Again, immediately. The girl woke up and walk. For she, for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. Immediately. You know, this is just a reminder of what is going to happen very soon. When the trumpet is going to sound and Jesus is going to come down from heaven, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Just a preview of what we have up here. Verse 43. But he commanded them shrieky. See, sometimes Jesus does things a little different. He saw the woman, he, he made the woman come out and he wanted the woman to tell a story to the whole crowd. But he command, in, in this case, he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. And said that something should be given to each. So he said, don't tell everybody what happened. And he said, you know, the girl, the girl is hungry. Give something to each. Give something to each. You see how Jesus will operate? Everything in order. Nothing unfaze him. Nothing stress him out. Everything under control. He always knows what he's doing. He's always sovereign. Sovereign. In 1932, Robert Cummings was a missionary in India. And while he was doing his missionary work in India, he became, he had a nurse breakdown. For some reason, he became obsessed by blas blasphemous and simple thoughts. Some or some air, Satan attacked him. And the mind, all he was kept hearing in his mind was simple and blasphemous thoughts which they overwhelmed him. He could not overcome. They overwhelmed him. And he had a nerves break down. So what the wife did is she took him and she brought him back to the United States of America. And he saw, saw the help of professional to try to heal him and help him with his need. But for two years, no matter what they try, nothing would help his emotional agony. Nothing could help him. Then one day, the word of a poem written by James Proctor that said this word, my soul is night, my heart is steel. I cannot see, I cannot feel for light, for life, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. As this man was in the mental world, this word came to his mind. And he said, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. And as he kept repeating this word, a miracle began taking place 
put them in. And he was completely healed. And his mind was restored to him. I must appeal simply to Jesus. Are you here this morning and you have a problem? You have a need? Jesus will help you. I can't do nothing for you. I could pray for you. He's a miracle worker. He's the one who could do anything. But you must appeal to him. You must draw close. But you know, but you might say, but Jesus is not here this morning. I mean, the story we read, Jesus was present, was physically present, and people touched him. Jesus is here this morning. His spirit is here. It doesn't have to be, you know, physically present here. His spirit is here. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, but I will be with you until the end of the age. Jesus said, when two or three gather together in my name, I'm going to be in their midst. We are more than three people in this room, so we know that Jesus is here. So what you do? You go to Jesus. You reach out to him in faith. And you tell him that you need a miracle. You tell him your problem that you're going through. And he's going to do something for you. Now, let, let me finish with this. Let me, let's recap a few things about faith. Faith must be... Let's see if, how you got those words? Faith must be active, not passive. Oh, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus knows my problem. Jesus knows my need. Jesus knows what I'm going through. If he wants to help me, let him come here. No! Faith must be active. You must go to Jesus. You must run to Jesus. You must reach out to Jesus. You must touch Jesus. If that's your attitude, that you, he's got to come to you, Forget it. You're going to go home the same way you came in. But if you are desperate enough, like this man was desperate, this woman was desperate, and you reach out to Jesus in faith, you cry out to him, you pour out your heart to him, and you tell Jesus, I'm thick and tired of being thick. I'm thick and tired of going through what I'm going through. I need your help right now. I, Jesus, touch me. He will touch you. The devil is going to try to stop you, but faith must be active to operate. And to receive answer. Number two. Faith works best. When the human solution fails. When, the, when man says there's no hope. Faith works best. You know why? Because we. We letting go. Of everything that we think is going to help us. Now it's Jesus or Jesus alone. Jesus or nothing. See, faith works best when human solution fail. Next one. Faith accepts the simplicity of the gospel. Simple faith is that Jesus loves me. He cares for me. And his interest in my need. And he's going to heal me. That's the simplicity of the gospel. It's not complicated. God loves me. For God loves me. And he gave Jesus the simplicity of the gospel. It's all including that God loves us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die a horrible death for you and I. And then he rose him for the grave. And now he cares for you. And he wants to help you. Now, the next one, some people said, oh, I know, but I my faith is not strong. I have little faith. Faith does not need to be perfect to be effective. You don't need a perfect faith. None of us has a perfect faith. You just need faith in Jesus. See, Jairus didn't have perfect faith. But they had faith. They had enough faith to allow the miracle to take place. So if you're sitting there and said, oh, you're watching me and said, I don't have my faith, is so weak. That's good enough. 
That's good enough for Jesus. Remember what he said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the mustard seed is the smallest of the seed. You could tell this mountain. And lastly, faith must be confessed. You've got to tell. You've got to speak it loud. Not to me. To Jesus. To Jesus. So what are we going to do now? Because I, we're going to sing a couple of songs because we want to build the atmosphere of worship. And as we build and as we worship the Lord, if you are here and you have a need, just cry out to Jesus. If you want me to pray for you, I will pray for you. But remember, Jesus, he will do the miracle. And you could just come and stand up here and I will pray for you. But I don't have to. Just where you're sitting down if you want. But just cry out to Jesus. Just tell Jesus what your problem is, what your need is. And you're going to walk out of this building this morning. You watch me the live stream. Jesus is going to touch you right where you are. He's going to perform a miracle. Just cry out to him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this two beautiful story in the form of a sandwich that demonstrates your love, your care, and your concern for people. And there's people right now in this room who have need, who have problems. And Father, I pray that you touch them, that as they cry out to you, as, as they er exercise their faith, you will, you will honor their faith, and immediately they will receive a miracle. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise his name. Praise his name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah, glory to your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
everything be all right, Lord. We thank you for we know that you're going to be there in the room and you're going to supersede, supervise everything that's going to take place, Lord. So we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. It's good all the time. It's good all the time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God Almighty. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Come on. Just tell him, Lord, my hope is in you. Take my life. Take all of me. Oh, yes, Jesus.
gave himself for you. He died for you. The least we can do is give our hope to him. Give our soul to him. Live for him every day of our life. So don't go home. We have a lot of food downstairs. Just go home and get something to eat and get to fellowship with, you know, the rest of the people. That's why we do that on Sunday. That's why we buy the food so that, you know, we can fellowship. We don't get, we don't get to talk to each other the whole week. So we're looking forward to talk, you know, for a little bit, you know, around something to eat. Let's take the offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. Lord, have your way. for the first time we welcome you in our service this morning nice to see you may the Lord bless you up one more time. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for everything you've done in this service. Can't wait for the testimony we're going to hear in the, in the near future, Lord, about how you touch people and you minister their need, Lord. We ask you that you give us a great afternoon, the fellowship downstairs, Lord, the Italian service at 2 p.m., Lord. We ask you that you bless our service, Lord, that you use it for your glory and for your honor. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for loving us, even when sometimes we become so unlovable, Lord. But God, you still love us and you care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.